Welcome everyone to QSMA Summit of Strength virtual webinar series. My name is Jessica Clark from QSMA, and we thank you all for joining with us today. We appreciate and are thankful for the support of our sponsors, Avexis, Biogen, and Genentech Roche for making the Summit of Strength webinar series possible. Thank you for all the questions that were submitted in advance of this webinar. We will try to answer many of these questions during the presentation. You are also able to submit questions throughout the webinar using the chat box feature, which you will find located in the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Lines will remain muted during the webinar other than for speakers. If you have any additional questions after the presentation and Q&A session, please contact the family support team at QRSMA by emailing familysupport at qrsma.org. One additional feature we would like to point out on today's webinar, since our first presenter will be using a live webcam for part of her presentation, when her live webcam is shared, you will be able to adjust the webinar box larger to see her demonstration. We would now like to introduce our first speaker, Tina DeWong, who is a physical therapist at Stanford University, and she will be presenting on physical therapy at home. Great. Thank you so much. Is everyone able to hear me okay? Um, first off, I want to thank um, QSMA for allowing me to uh, present today. Um, I'll have to admit I was a little nervous at trying to fit all the information in in such a small period of time. So um, I uh, please excuse me in advance for us moving through some topics quickly. But the intent really today is to give you some tools in your toolbox to, um, to uh, do as much physical therapy and work with your um, therapist as best as possible while we are in this um, phase of being at home. So here are my disclosures. So quickly, I always like to let everyone know where we're going to be at the end of this presentation. So quickly, I'm going to start with a really brief review of standards of care, basically just saying that it is out there and it's um, a great reference for you to share with your local physical therapist. And then the um, other, the rest of the um, talk, I'm going to talk about some physical therapy concepts, including how you could use it in telemedicine, um, neuromuscular education concepts that you could use to help facilitate um, physical therapy at home uh, with your uh, yourselves or your caregivers, and then uh, methods to monitor exercise and how to progress it. And you'll see the constant theme um, running back and forth here and the, about communication, right? Um, and so you're going to hear that reiterated quite a bit um, throughout the next th 45 minutes or so. Then I'll go through some examples of progression uh, that you could do for each one of these exercises. Keep in mind, this is a short um, uh, presentation, so we're not going to go into detail, but hopefully this will give you um, some um, examples that you can empower yourself to help um, work with your therapist. Okay. So, of course, in the standards of care, there's nine focus areas, and today we're going to focus on physical therapy and rehab. In the um, standards of care for the physical therapy section, we talk about exercise interventions in three functional categories, non-sitters, sitters, and walkers. And um, I'm good, I just want to glaze over what some of these mean, but you can refer back to the, um, the, uh, the manuscript itself for more details. But primarily in the non-sitter group, what you're really looking at, as you'll see throughout all of the functional groups, is function. We really want to optimize function. And this will vary depending on your child, depending on your abilities, but really wanting to tolerate um, some positions that may be difficult, such as upright, um, and optimize um, performance. And you'll see it in the sitter category because um, uh, there will be more focus on, again, um, function and maintaining function, but also with treatment that kind of changes the paradigm of going from maintaining to, to gains, right? And so how do you, how do you balance between um, the maintenance as well as the kind of the, the habilitation of goals? And then most importantly, too, is that contractures become a factor whenever um, you're in the sitting category because you don't want contractors to inhibit your ability to move. 
And there's activities and exercise programs that are part of some of the recommendations in the standards of care. We won't go into that in detail um, just because that can be a reference. And I just wanted this to give you a little um, 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 introduction to um, some of the physical therapy things. And then of course with walkers, the focus primarily in the standards of care is looking at exercise um, and that includes strengthening as well as aerobic. And so it doesn't mean that if you're in the non-sitters or, or sitter category that this does not apply. It's just different mechanisms that you may need to use or assistive devices or adaptations to make, um, to make it work for you. Okay, so that being said, I know that every time I present those slides, everyone says, okay, great, Tina, it's, it's lovely in theory, but how do we do it? So I'm gonna give you some insights on how you can communicate with your therapist in order for you to get the most out of physical therapy at home. And of course we can't do that without first talking about telehealth. In this era of COVID, telehealth help has been a, a stronger factor in our interventions. We know that Curisamea has said that one of the biggest factors in the medical management is that for patients with SMA, they're not being able to see their physical therapist. So how can you change the paradigm in which physical therapy is being delivered for yourself or your patients or your, or, or your um, child? And so telehealth has been around for a very long time. Um, one of the first times I've ever done telehealth was when I first got out of PT school, and I'm not gonna mention when that was. <laughs> but with telehealth, you know that um, we've done this to help educate. So part of physical therapy telehealth is us being able to communicate to you what we're thinking and help guide progression and monitor monitoring of um, physical therapy. And so there's different ways of delivering telehealth. And so really the, the primary thing about telehealth is really providing guidance. And there's mechanisms to do that. One is a, what they call a synchronous method, and that's live video. That's like me and you right now on the screen, and we'll have video and we're video sharing where I can watch you work, and then I can provide you input on how to um, make changes and progress throughout um, a televisit. And usually with a televisit, especially for um, patients with SMA, you'll probably need a, a helper. We call it an e-helper. And that person can help move your body parts, it can help position things, can help with the camera so that you can get the most value out of your e-visit. Other methods are called asynchronous methods. And so this one is not a direct video visit necessarily. You may send home videos to your therapist, which I know many of you um, already do, and then you get input. And so that with that input, you can change the way that you progress or um, help um, add or adapt different things for your care. And so these are different mechanisms that you can use both. You can use one or the other, whatever works best for you, because this is an individualized process. And the goal really is to make it useful for you. And so how does it and what can you do to make it work best for you? And the first thing is to develop goals. And so at home, we are at, you know, when you see a therapist, you should always have collaborative goals to begin with. And the way when you're at home, that's particularly more important. And talking to some of my great colleagues, what we found is the advantage, the silver lining to this telehealth at home is that we get to have a sneak peek at what your home life is. And so we can help collaborate on a goal that makes that is relevant to you. Because if a goal is not relevant to you and what you wanna do, you're not setting yourself up for success, right? And then part of the, uh, the goal setting is to develop a home exercise program. And this home exercise program should not be dictated by me, the physical therapist. It should entirely be driven by you as the patient or the um, caregiver, right? And so what we do in telehealth is that we are going to monitor how the therapy is working for you, the recommendations that we're providing, and then we'll, we'll adapt it as necessary for progression of the activities. And then of course, this consultation. We can also review other things like braces, assistive devices, and wheelchairs. There's mechanisms now in, in a lot of our institutions that we're trying to be able to do this in a telehealth fashion so that we can give you the best recommendations without um, adding the increased risk of having you come in to, to see us unnecessarily. So those are the things that are the, the few things that um, could be done via telehealth. And of course, talk to your therapist because they're, you know, the 
the options are far and wide here as well. Okay. So in general, then the next thing I want to talk about are the PT concepts. You're not going to go through PT school in the next 30 minutes, so don't worry. But really, I want to talk about what we are thinking when we're watching you move or watching anybody move. If you know a therapist, we're a little weird about watching um, um, people move because the things that we're thinking about are how are they moving, what muscles are being activated, what biomechanics are in play to make somebody move or help someone move. So you know in SMA, there is muscle imbalances around a joint. And so because of that, how can you use your strengths to meet the goals of movement that, that you have, right? And so that plays into the factor of how long your muscles are. So contractures, tightness in your muscles, and then um, that also affects your skeletal alignment, so your bones, okay? All of that plays together to help you move. And then, uh, we can't talk about um, this, this, the muscle and the skeleton without talking about the brain. So all of this communication is not only amongst yourself and your therapist, but also with your body, okay? So you ha the, what happens in the brain is that you have the sensory and the motor cortex, as you can see here on the right. And so they have to communicate so that your body knows where your hands and legs are at all times. And then the motor portion helps moves that, right? And so with SMA, depending how long you've had the disease, your muscle may have, you know, fallen asleep, or you could say. And with it being asleep, you have to wake it up to remind that it, remind it that it needs to help you move, right? And so it's kind of dormant. And so there's different ways that we give the uh, feedback for the muscles to wake up to move. And so I'm going to give you a few of the techniques that we use that kind of help us in facilitating that. And so, you know, physical therapy is very hands-on. Uh, we're not expecting you to have you know, physical therapy hands, but our job also is to communicate and how you could best use your hands to to help your um, your 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 patients move or your um, your um, sons or daughters move. Okay, and part of this is done by what we call neuromuscular education, and this is a way to train your muscles brain and nerves to communicate with one another. It's a mind and body connection or mind and muscle connection. And you could use that by using your visual input, having a mirror, having your eyes guide the movement, as well as um, um, using facilitation techniques to wake up your muscles. And these are hand, you know, you know, techniques that foster this communication between your mind and muscle. And some of these facilitation techniques there's a lot more um, in the in in the PT's tool belt, but these from a neurological PT are some of the basic ones that you may even see us innately doing sometimes when we're working with you. And one of them is tapping. And tapping basically is exactly what it sounds. You're going to find the muscle belly that you're working. You know, so if I'm trying to eat, bringing my hand to my mouth, I'm going, you know, one of the muscles I need to use uh, would be my elbow um, flexors. So I tap on the belly of my muscle a few times to say, hey, biceps, wake up, I need you to work. And so as I'm bringing my hand to my mouth, I'm tapping that muscle to remind it that it needs to work. It seems innate, but if your muscle's been asleep, it's not used to um, being used. So it doesn't know that that's the muscle that needs to work at the time. The other thing you can do is what we call brushing. And so what that is, is you could do the same thing. You could put your finger on the muscle belly and you could stroke it up towards the movement. So again, another way to provide input, input um, to the muscle itself. So that sensory input to help with motor movement, you can add the visual component. So you're combining everything in a Zen type of fashion, okay? Lastly is joint compression. So you'll notice that we do this innately as well. And joint compression is not just putting, compressing the two sides of a joint together, but part of it's also distracting a joint. And what we do when we distract or compress a joint are changing the way that the receptors in the joint respond. And so this is primarily important in stabilization of body parts. So knees, elbows, um, the trunk, all of this is really, really important because you need to have a strong base in which to move. And so I'll talk a lot about stabilization. And what this really does is facilitates a co-contraction around a joint. And so with SMA, you have some muscles that are stronger than others. And so we may work on different muscle groups knowing that with SMA typically, um, for example, 
the knee extensors are weaker than the um, the knee flexors. So we may try to work more on the knee uh, extensors because of that imbalance. But either way, that co-contraction is very, very important for the safety of, um, of the activity and the prevention of um, injury later on. So that being said, it's all nice in theory, but then what exercises should you do? Right. So what we think about is um, some of the research that's done in specificity of training. That's just big terminology to basically say exercise, work on the activity you want to do. So this, again, goes back to emphasizing your collaboration with your therapist. What are the goals you want to work on? It doesn't mean you shouldn't work on general things. Like, for example, if you want to increase your your cardiovascular um, strength, you may want to do a bike. Um, but if you want to walk, you would need to work on, on activities that are related to walking. So general training helps in a general way. Specific training really helps in a specific way. The research shows that muscle adaptation is very specific to the task for translation of that skill. So if you want to walk, your therapist can help break down the task to ensure that you make those small gains to get to the longer term goal, okay? So then we can't talk about this without the muscle length tension relationship. So you can see here in this figure that in order to do squats, there's different ranges of motion that's happening at the knees as well as the shoulder. And muscle fibers do not produce the same force when it's activated in different aspects of the range of motion. So you want to work the entire range of motion, right? So that's easier said than done. How do you do it when your muscles are not able to move your arms or legs throughout the range of motion? Your therapist can help identify where the weaker points in that range of motion so they can adapt where to support that to provide you the ability to activate, be active, your muscles to be as active as possible to work on those weaker aspects of the range of motion and then provide the input for the stronger ranges, you know, areas of the range of motion that's stronger. So that is a, is a way to look at quality over quantity. And we can't emphasize this enough. It takes a lot of patience um, to really look at quality. You're looking at muscle, not momentum. And I know a lot of you out there use momentum to get the job done, right? But if you're exercising, make that 15, 30 minutes that you're spending a day really worth its while by making sure you check your mechanics. So you see the two people on the screen right now um, at the gym. You see people doing this all the time. The super buff guy just throwing a weight around. You're scared he's just going to drop it because he's just waving his body all over the place. But the best way to do it is this skinnier guy with the smaller weight, nice and controlled. He's really focused on what he's doing. Okay. So Use different devices to make it happen through the range of motion. There's wands and different things you can use, pulley systems and bands, all these things you're able to get at a sporting goods store and your therapist can help um, identify what's best for you. Then of course, as the caregiver, you can use yourself and the way that you handle your hands to support appropriately. And again, your therapist definitely has a skill set to help you understand that better. And most importantly, like, any exercise program, consistency is key. You can't be the weekend warrior and be able to make the larger gains. So it's better to do a little bit every day than make up for it over the weekend and do an hour or two hours worth of that work, okay? Because your muscles and your body needs the time to heal. And appreciate all the successes. Make sure that you break down a task so that you have success so that you can be consistent with your, with your goals or your activities. Easier said than done, when you're at home, what do you have to use to be able to do some of these things if you can't go to the store? Um, and so there's other things you can use and your therapist can help identify things. You can give them a tour of your home so they can provide, they can look and see what may be helpful. And um, weights can be anything in the house. So there's just basic coins you can use, fruits, vegetables, um, milk, rice, all of these things. They have different shapes. They have different weights. Let your therapist help you identify what's wor what works best for you. And then, of course, think outside the box. So here are just, there's your SMA community. There's different, you know, 
there's an intent of different uh, activities and you know angel arms and and bicycles and different things, but you put them in different positions. What I find is I learn so much from the SMA community. On Facebook, there's SMA adaptability where the most creative people exist, right? And so co contact your 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 community. They have a lot of insight on adapting things to uh, to help um, you do what uh, what you would like to do. Okay, so now that we go to a training program, what um, is what is the basic requirements in a training program? And that is frequency. So again, iterating consistency, how often do you do it, right? Then intensity, how hard is it? And time, which is how long you do it. And then the type, are you working on strength? Are you working on endurance? A lot of times, whenever you're you're weaker, strength and endurance, they 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 blur the lines a little bit. Okay, so the question usually is intensity. How do I know how much is enough? Okay, there's different ways of doing it. Um, and then how do you tell between if, if it's strength or endurance? The best way to monitor intensity and the easiest way is what we call the talk test. It is basically you can talk, but you can't sing during activity. I know that doesn't sound scientific whatsoever, but a lot of the studies out there even looking at elite athletes show that there is high reliability and validity in using just the talk test to understand and moderate moderate intensity activities. If you want to be a little more scientific about it and actually um, put numbers to it, there's things called the rate of perceived exertion scales. Some scales are 0 to 10. Um, the Omni scale is 6 to 20. But basically, it gives you, you can give a rating to how hard you think you're working. And so with intensity, light exercise, which is what you'd use for a warm up, is a rate of perceived exertion of less than 5. Or if you're looking at heart rate, you want to make sure it's 50 to 63% your maximal heart rate. And your therapist can help you understand how to calculate maximal heart rate if you don't already know how to do it, right? But the ideal workout intensity is moderate. And that's a heart rate of 64 to 76%, right? And that's a, that's a, a rate of perceived exertion of about five or six. And that follows along the lines of the top test, okay? I know everyone wants to have um, ingredients on how to how to exercise the best, but it's so individual. And the best advice I can give now is for you to communicate um, all of this information with your therapist so they can customize it with you. And part of that communication is that since your therapist isn't home with you 24 hours a day, they need to know what you're doing. So I always recommend an exercise calendar. So the exercise calendar should have the parameters of the of the fit, which is frequency, intensity, time time and type. Um, on the screen is an example of what um, we hand out at Stanford that, get, that allows patients to track what they're doing. You could track this, you can send it to your therapist um, and then have your telehealth visit so your therapist can look at this and, and really focus on some of the activities that you've been working on and work on your strengths as well as the areas that need more improvement. Okay, so overall an exercise program should have three things, flexibility, and that includes stretching and passive range of motion, okay? Strength training, which includes stabilization, and that's kind of my soapbox, so you'll hear I, I'll talk about that a lot. Uh, when it comes to weight training, that's more high resistance and low reps, okay? So um, the last thing is cardiovascular training, and that's low resistance, high reps. And so as you most of you know, that'd be something like biking, swimming, and things like that. Before you start any kind of exercise, I always say you have to kind of be ready for it. You have to be mentally ready for it, but then how do you get your, your, your musculoskeletal system ready for it? Um, because if your muscles are tight and you already have some weakness, it's, you're gonna now have to work against that tightness. So there's some things that you can do to kind of ready for yourself for success. And one of it's massage. Massage has been proven to increase um, uh, flexibility and decrease tightness, at least short term, right? And increase the circulation in your blood. Again, it also can makes that mind-body connection. Stretching does similar things, um, decreases the stiffness. And then that's also what passive range of motion does. And you can also do some of the facilitation techniques I mentioned earlier about joint compression and brushing. 
And then with stretching, I won't go into details about this, but there's different ways of doing it, uh, which you're, uh, if you're doing it actively or your caregiver is doing it, um, there's a link here that is that I've made a really long time ago. It is made for Duchenne, but the concept for stretching and the methods of stretching are still similar. So if you want um, some techniques, it is on this website. And then of course, there's positioning and different equipment that you can use to help with stretching. And then from a PT standpoint, there are things that we call kind of PNF techniques, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. And one of them is contract relax. And what, what it does, it, it makes you contract the muscle that, um, that's opposite the muscle you're stretching. Right, so I usually have people do this with breathing. First off, it calms you down, but it also allows for a better stretch. It's similar to the concept of yoga when they say, hey, deep breath in, okay, now relax and let it go and stretch into it a little bit more. That's kind of the concept of it that your therapist can work with you, especially in telehealth um, for the contract relax. The other one that I like, iterates that entire range of motion. You have your caregiver provide assistance along the range of motion areas that um, are difficult for you and provide resistance in the area that is a little bit stronger. So you're working throughout that entire range of motion, but your caregiver is, is in tune with you. So, you know, whoever whoever's helping you, a caregiver, personal trainer, you have to be one with one another's um, body to understand on how much assistance or resistance may be needed. So this next video is just a quick example so that you can understand what's happening here. This lady, her, um, she has her personal trainer um, and her personal trainer is moving her through this range of motion. And as she's pulling her arm back, she is providing more resistance whenever the gravity is eliminated in order for her to actually work her muscles and providing that assistance as she's needed. So she's moving throughout the range and not only the, uh, the without a personal trainer here, she would only be able to move maybe her arm 10 degrees. Having someone help throughout this entire range allows that movement and that strengthening for a much more functional combined movement. So when we talk about strengthening, I just want to give an overview of what that means. Um, isometric is basically your muscles are contracting, but there's no movement. And so that is the co-contraction that we talked about earlier um, that could be facilitated with some of the joint compression. Then you can prog progress from isometric muscle activation to concentric, which is when your muscle shortens, okay, and you actually get a movement. And then the harder one is eccentric. And eccentric, basically, anytime you have to control a movement, that muscle has to work in an eccentric fashion, okay? So this is a way to progress strength. Okay, so that in mind, it's always nice. We always like video. So um, what do we do whenever we make a recommendation for you? We look at how you move and we decide on what parts of the body that we should focus on to help improve some of that movement. So with this little girl, I'm not gonna talk in detail, but more to just show you how she moves, okay? So she swings, she goes on the playground with this little horsey. So here, she's standing with some support followed by standing, leaning on a chair, okay? So keep her in mind as we talk about different things. So when I look at her, what do I wanna work on? I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna work on some head control because I don't know if you got to see it really well in the video, but in, a, in order for her to move, she kind of throws her head from one place to another to, to look around and it's less controlled in the mid range. And so I'm giving, the next, the next few slides are just examples that are not exactly all related to her, but in order to encompass everybody's different abilities, examples of how you can progress different body parts. And so here's one where um, with head control, you can take away gravity by doing some, some um, chin tucks in lying down. And the good thing about lying down, you can also work on your trunk. Your trunk is really important to work on for stabilization. So here where the arrow is, if you're a caregiver, you can stick your hand underneath um, a person's back and just have them smush your hand. If any of you do yoga, this is very similar to that concept. You're gonna push your, push the, your, your back um, towards the hand and do some chin tucks while you're laying down, followed by doing it while you're sitting up. Followed by after that, trying to get that stabilization, rotating your head actively and making sure that you can use your eyes to kind of increase that activity. 
And then of course, as you get stronger, you can use some resistive stabilization, right? So this doesn't apply to everyone, but these are different areas in which, you know, may be applicable to you. I wanna show this because I thought this is kind of fun because everybody always asks about unique ways of um, doing head exercises. And so you saw this young lady, she had um, you know, a, a light uh, thing that she's wearing on her head and she is trying to find a target. So this is really trying to not only isometrically work her neck muscles, but also focus on the quality. You can do this with your kids um, with something like this, where you're looking for a bullseye, or you can paint on the wall with it. So all these things are creative ways to make exercise a little bit more interesting. And then of course, we can't talk about head stabilization without trunk stabilization. And I'll work really hard not to put too much time on this because I think one of the things that um, we, we miss out on is that um, that's a little bit more boring is trunk stabilization. You have to have a firm base in order for you to move your hands and legs. So a lot of times we look like this boy here on the left, especially now that we're sitting in front of our computers all the time. You wanna make sure there's a co-contraction of the abs and back. And what that means is basically when you're sitting up, if someone was gonna punch you in the stomach, what's your reaction? You'll tighten up. Or if you need to pee really bad, what do you need to do? You tighten up, right? So you wanna work on that tightening up and you wanna increase the time that you spend in that co-contracted state, right? Once you, I usually say do it in front of the TV, do it during commercials, do it in the car uh, while you're at a stoplight. Once you gain some time with this, add arms and see if you can lift your arms. Then see if you can reach outside your base of support, okay? Whoops. So we look at this little girl um, and she's doing her own exercises by lifting this pillow, but look at the way she moves. And so what I would, as a therapist, what I wanna work on here is what's called thoracic extension, is looking at this portion of her spine, right? She's moving by tilting her head, she's moving by, by pushing her belly forward, but this part, we see it's kind of kyphotics, what we call it, and it's kind of stuck. So we want to focus on that. And we notice that a lot of kids need to work on that, but that's kind of hard because it's a, an area even um, as adults we don't um, we don't focus on. So the in order to get that thoracic extension, you need to have the mobility in that area of the spine. So these are a couple of ways that you can stretch that aspect of the spine, like I said, prepare your body to be able to move, right? So there's this pillow um, that you can lie on, open up your chest, stretch that, um, that, um, um, that chest. And then a nice one also is a towel roll where you could put underneath your arms and then it kind of stabilizes you and you're able to stretch only that, that chest part. And what I mean by that is not arching your back, it's really a small movement just at your chest. And then, of course, the strengthening piece of it. So you can see here the therapist has her hands in front of the patient, but also facilitating in the back. Um, what I like about some of these examples is that when we think about helping someone move, we want, you know, usually people are trying to do some kind of extension moment. And so trying to stand up or, or lift their head up. So you naturally want to lift their head up to, to get rid of gravity, but the best way to facilitate muscle movement is to show the muscle how to work. And so here, in order for her to extend, you'll notice the therapist is pushing their hands down to facilitate um, the hands interacting with the ground. The hand needs to push down into the ground in order for the body to go up. And you'll see this constant theme in lower extremity exercises as well as upper extremity exercises. And here, I just want to show you uh, uh, an adult who does a nice job um, progressing in her trunk stabilization. She started with wearing a vest, followed by using yoga blocks to help her sit up. Then she um, was sitting up longer without any kind of support. And then they further progress to her sitting there and then moving her hands, right? And you saw her earlier, she now has progressed to the ability to be able to do some perturbations while she's sitting, okay? So you'll notice that everything is just examples of progressions that, um, that you may use and fall in within that spectrum, okay? Now I get to talk about my favorite muscle, uh, which is the gluteus medius, and that's going to be important in standing. And what we look at when we watch someone stand is how level their hip is, okay? If your gluteus medius is strong and activated when you lift your leg, you'll notice the hip stays stable. If it's weak, 
you'll notice here that the hips would tilt, right? And so for good shifting of weight to, from one leg to the other, your gluteus medius is working quite a bit. And so to do uh, pelvic girdle strengthening, what you may need to look at is um, um, progression of this. So you can go from tall kneeling, and you'll notice again here the therapist is pushing down, right? She's not lifting up to get him up. You may need help with that transition up, but the downward motion is where the therapeutic aspect of muscle activation exists, followed by half kneeling. Then they could progress to maybe standing two legs, standing with one leg on, um, on a bench. Again, that facilitates that glute med to activate. And um, here's another example in standing. You could stand with uh, uh, two legs, one leg, one hand support, followed by one leg, no hands, then adding your hands. And then here you can do hip dips as you get a little as you get a little bit stronger, right? So all of these, as you can see, there's a theme where there's stabilization followed by a dynamic activity that requires more stabilization before you move, right? And um, those of you who know me know that I love dancing, and so one of the best exercises is this right here. I'll turn down the music a little bit. This is when I uh, this is probably. 15, 20 years ago. But this boy does a perfect example of weight shifting, right? And dancing, you could do this at home. It makes it interesting. It doesn't seem like an exercise, okay? And then do you see now I'm on my knees. If they can't stand to do it, you could do it while you are um, on your knees. So dancing happens a lot of ways and it's a fun task to do that works on pelvic strength and weight shifting that can translate better to walking, okay? Um, I'm almost done, so don't worry. Um, next, we'll talk about the limbs really quick. Same theory on progression. You start with gravity eliminated to um, the ability to add resistance and um, in gravity, uh, um, against gravity positions. Just because you can't move your um, arms or legs against gravity does not mean that you can't strengthen it with weights, right? So here, she's doing it with a TRX. Okay, at home, you may not have that. So I have a, a video, we don't have to go through the whole thing at all, but you could see me here where I'm using a cloth to try to help move my hand, okay? And then I'm facilitating my biceps to work, right? So no weights, followed by me holding a tomato, um, a, I don't know, carrots and different things. It may seem small, but these are all the little things that you can use at home to help strengthen, um, to help strengthen, right? And so this is a gravity eliminated elbow flexion, right? And then you can, when you get stronger, you can move towards um, anti-gravity, okay? And then same thing with anti-gravity, you can add the weights, okay? Same thing with knee extension. The only thing I wanna emphasize here is open versus closed chain. Open chain is what this young man or this man is doing. Um, no weights, legs are not planted on the ground. And just a reminder, just like this little girl, it's like when she was swinging, okay? You can add weights to that as you get a little bit stronger. And then the most functional is closed chain. Closed chain, again, is your interaction with your body with the ground. Your feet are planted. Okay, and then you're pushing down on the ground to stand up to get that extensor moment. The higher the, um, the seat that you're sitting on, the easier the task. So you wanna make sure that you can progress in that fashion. And if you're at a playground, that can still happen. This little girl, her legs on the little pony thing that she's riding on, she's pushing into that pony and activating those quads, right? So um, be creative. And then there's closed chain range of motion focus. So as you can see with this little girl, she couldn't get that end range extension. You can work on that range, that specific range itself. Your therapist can help you with that, with equipment or with your hands, okay? So just a reminder, set your goals, make sure you know what you want to do, make sure that um, this is, uh, that that the goals are specific to, to your end goals, make sure that you prep your body for your mind and muscle connection, and prepare yourself to do it, uh, to have the assistance you need, to have the appropriate setup, and of course, communication, communication with your helper, with, um, with your body, 
And remember to work the entire range of motion, um, get the assistance you need to do that. And it's about the quality and not the momentum. Track your exercise calendars and, um, and use telehealth in a way to help make you feel more confident with the guidance of establishing that exercise as well as the progression. And so, of course, thank you, everyone. And um, we'll, I'll end this with um, a dance with one of my favorite kiddos in the world. Um, he's dancing with his mom. So, like I said, you can be creative. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to give you a little glimpse in the uh, mind of a PT. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, Tina. Um, hi, everyone. This is Sarah with Kira um, Next, we're going to go over a few questions that have come in from our community. Question number one, can you get rid of contracture with enough stretching? Okay. The short answer is um, no. But all that being said, I have a lot of caveats here. Um, so there are... Um, studies that show that if you have a true contracture that you cannot stretch and change that contracture. But I want everyone to know that when people use the term contracture, we don't all define it the same. A real contracture is one where say you move your joint and with your joint, um, there's a hard infield. It feels like uh, it's, it's when you, it's like a rock, right? Um, th that is a true contracture. And that's not going to change unless there is a more like surgical intervention. But sometimes people describe contractures, but really what it is, is tightness. So what we found that some patients with, uh, who have quote unquote contractures, they really have just ranges of severe tightness. And if you have tightness, if you get stronger and if you stretch, that that could improve itself. So that, I mean, there's a, it's, it's a complicated question, um, but the, the short answer is that it's depending on how it's defined, right? And so that's why whenever you talk about contractures, um, there could be a lot of controversy about it because the innate operational definition of contractures are not always the same. But that being said, does that mean you should not stretch? Absolutely not. Um, stretching really does help with increased blood flow to the muscles. Um, it really helps lubricate the joints, which is important to help you move and um, decrease stiffness. Like I said, you really do have to um, decrease the stiffness to improve the um, strengthening that you're doing. And we typically recommend about 90 seconds if you look at kind of the, um, the muscle physiology aspects of it, um, whether it's 30 seconds, three times um, or not, but those are the, the general recommendations. Wonderful, and then the next question, can you share exercises to work on regaining the ability to get off the floor by walking hands up legs? Okay, so um, this is a really hard one to, to talk in this short amount of time. So um, I just broke this down just to give you an example of what your therapist may provide, right? So if you ask your therapist something like that, they will break down each task and see what you can work on to work on each one of these tasks. I'm obviously not gonna talk through each one of these, these um, tasks, but this is an example of a task breakdown. Then I just have some um, examples of things that, that I thought was kind of cute. Um, um, for rolling, for example, this um, this uh, therapist is using a blanket to help the child roll over. There's use of balls and things, and these balls again, you can you definitely can get at a um, at a a sports store that helps with some of the weight shifts. And of course, none of this I would recommend you do without having a consultation with your therapist to do it safely. Then your therapist has the ability to provide you handouts. And the handouts are nice because they actually shows you where you should put your hands. And that's gonna be really important as you're working on gaining skills to have your caregiver really be able to know where to put their hand and their pressure to help facilitate that movement. Thank you, Tina. And then our final question, can you share a variety of exercises to encourage kneeling and standing? My son has core strength to scoot and remain upright at least 10 feet, but he's four years old and the key is making the activities fun. 
Right. Um, fun is the key. And so fun is all in creativity. So if you know any um, um, pediatric PTs, which I'm sure all of you had at some point, uh, were a little weird because we have to make the boring things fun. Um, and so here are just some examples that you could do. Like I said, I think I'm biased to saying this. I think dancing is the, the funnest one. Um, if, if you've been to MDA camp, you'll know that um, every D MDA camp has a dance. Why? Because we all love to move. And so um, like that little boy who is who is doing merengue, I would suggest dancing. But besides dancing, there are other things you can do, like playing ball on your knees, playing ball in half kneel, um, and uh, playing games and playing board games, different things like that, which will help you as well as, you know, your, your sons or daughters to doing it in the activity. And then of course, while you're doing it, they can play for like example, this little boy here, he's playing in half kneel, you know, it's fine. He's a little distracted, but it allows him to be in this half kneel position. The therapist is, or mother is pushing down on the knees to kind of get that extension movement to, um, to, activate the knee extensors as well as activate the hip extensors a little bit back here too. And there's other positional devices too that allows a modified kneeling position if, you're, if your ki uh, kids are having a little bit more difficulty. Um, but those are just some general ideas. Talk to your therapist because they can really hone into your child's interests to make sure that um, the activities make sense for your home as well as the interest of your child.